going to start on this section of interrupts with peripherals. So maybe I should turn down that light a little bit more to make it easier to read the screen. And without further ado, I think you are pretty familiar with the concept of interrupts, right? I think almost all of you have had this in the past, right? Is that yes? I'm sorry, the Indian yes is like that, right? <laughs> or it's the, the Indian yes is like this or something like that? I can't remember. Um, and the U.S. yes is just kind of like, eh. <laughs> so um, when we're talking about embedded applications, we're going to talk about how you can um, operate some of these uh, operations. Now, if you remember from a previous class, or actually several previous classes, we talked about instances of you're running a timer, right? And you want to count up to a certain amount of time, maybe one second. And rather than checking back and saying, is it a second yet? Is it a second yet? Is it a second yet? It would be really nice to just have an interrupt or some sort of event that will interrupt you and saying, yep, it's time, time to do it, right? So uh, we're going to talk about interfacing with the real world because sometimes there's external events uh, like a switch press that will also make some sort of impact, right? So maybe if somebody presses a switch, rather than you sitting there and listening and polling for the switch, you'd want to say, a switch was pressed, now it's time to do something. So how do we external or monitor an external or for that matter, some sort of internal event? Well, what we've, constant, or what we've done, and this is a good example for the uh, uh, serial communications lab, you can constantly monitor for the situation. In this case, if you're looking at a button press, you can constantly monitor all the switches and just keep checking whether they're being pressed or not. Which is kind of a waste of time, isn't it? Because the processor is again checking and how frequently does it check to see if some event has happened. And so not very, uh, not very effective, so maybe one, uh, one thing to think about is um, the code required for this tends to be messy and multiple calls and a big loop and check if the peripheral is ready or not. And so it's always much better just to have some sort of um, interrupt or some event uh, identified as saying, now it's time to take care of me. So we like to use and set up interrupts, which I believe in your code you've already done, although you may not have known it. Um, this has been involved in some of the, uh, the earlier labs that you've done. And by doing interrupts, you can have the processor do other tasks. And when the external event actually provides you data or provides you with some information, then you work on that data. A good example is, remember the cues we talked about in the serial communications. I really don't want to examine every single character as it comes in for GPS. I really want to wait until all the GPS data has come in and then I want to go through that whole big string and work with it. And so the nice thing that I could do is I would set up a interrupt service routine that whenever a character arrived it would put it off into the queue. It would also check for the end of, uh, end of string character and then maybe do something else. In fact, we'll look at that a little bit later. In fact, we'll look at that as an example towards the end of class. So the signal to get the attention of the CPU is an interrupt, as, uh, as I've been talking, it, talking about it before. But to have the CPU stop its current computation, save the state, in other words, save all the information of what it's working on, and then go handle or address that interrupt is called interrupt handling. And that interrupt handling is done in what we call an interrupt service routine. And so we're going to look at how you would set up interrupt service routines or, or use interrupt service routines to handle any of my uh, operations or my uh, um, tasks. So let's have a nice example here. This is uh, a wonderful example 
uh, done by my co-author of uh, the first uh, Embedded Systems book, and he liked this. Let's say I'm going to make breakfast, and I'm doing a classical English breakfast. That means I'm doing tea. I don't do this coffee stuff, right? Um, or am I doing coffee? Oh, I am doing coffee. I take that back. I change it to American, right? And I'm doing coffee the old-fashioned way, using a... Uh, 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 one of these special things that you do drip coffee, not a Mr. Coffee where you push a button, but you actually have to pour boiling water. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, since I know that boiling water takes the most time, I'm going to uh, put the kettle or put the water in the kettle. I should change this for the modern day. Um, do it on the microwave, right? So I'm going to boil some water. And then I'm going to take this uh, nice little device. Have you ever seen one of these? Like a, like a, this would be, I guess a coffee press could be the same thing, right? So I'm going to put the, uh, the coffee in my coffee press, let's say. And uh, uh, then I'm going to get it all ready to, to make myself a, a cup of drip coffee or coffee press or whatever. And then I'll go to the, to the refrigerator and I'll pull out milk and I'll go to the cereal or go to the... Um, to the pantry and get my cereal, and I haven't had a chance to get my bowl and to pour the cereal and do the other, other stuff. But my interrupt occurs, and my interrupt is that the water boils and the kettle whistles, or the microwave says beep and uh, you know, the, the water has been nuked in enough, uh, hot enough. So let's consider my water boiling as an interrupt. And I have this special thing I now do based on that boiling water. That being, I'm going to put down whatever's in my hands. I'm going to turn off the burner, pour the boiling water into the coffee filter, pick up whatever was put down, and then I'm going to return for my interrupt service routine back to what I was doing previously. And, uh, and then I'm going to get the bowl from the cabinet, pour the cereal in the bowl, uh, get the spoon, put the milk back in the fridge. Who knows, I'll probably put the, uh, now nah, leave the cereal box out because I'm going to have another bowl. So, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, you get the idea of, of interrupt service, you know, regular processing, interrupt service routine, what will cause an interrupt? So, if we look at how the CPU itself, this is the hardware and the microcode inside the CPU that you don't program, but it, this is what it says happens whenever a, uh, uh, an interrupt occur. The CPU will finish processing its current instruction. Now, when we say the current instruction, that means the current assembly language instruction. Remember, sometimes a C or C++ instruction is expanded into a couple of assembly language instructions. So it'll finish the current assembly language instruction. Then it will save the program counter. What does the program counter to do or point to? The next instruction that will execute. So it will save that. Then it will run an interrupt service routine. Typically inside of that interrupt service routine, it's going to, um, it's going to save the flags and in fact, that's part of what the processor does. Oh, there it is up there. Save the program counter and the flags to the stack. Now, you had computer organization, so you should all know what the stack is, right? Yes? Who does not know what the stack is? There will be a test on this later. All right, so you all know what the stack is. So the program counter and the flags, flags being did the last operation result in a negative number or zero or uh, some other types of uh, flags or settings. It runs the interrupt service routine. Sometimes in the service routine, it will also save off some other registers too. And actually when you're writing in C, that'll handle itself. You don't have to worry about this. You're not writing assembly language code. So the C will handle saving any scratch, uh, uh, scratch registers that may be overwritten as a result of the interrupt service routine. Then when it's all the way at the end, the interrupt service routine 
you will exit from it, you'll just do a return. And the, uh, the program counter and the flags will be pulled off the stack and the program counter then points to the next instruction execute wherever you were in your main program. This is really easy to identify that, right? So, interrupt service routines, ISRs, are associated with each interrupt, or actually an interrupt service routine may be called based on several interrupts. So imagine in your microcontroller memory is this code for the interrupt service routine. And this code is at a particular address. That particular address is stored in what we call the interrupt vector table. The address to the beginning of the interrupt service routine is stored in a interrupt vector table. So that means if an interrupt occurs, for example, if a button press results in some sort of interrupt that you want to do something special. Well, where in the heck is that coming? Is that coming from you back there, Kona? Oh, yeah, okay. You're going to fix that, right? <laughs> and the, uh, let's see, where was I again? Now I lost my train of thought. Uh, you get a zero for the day, all right? <laughs> So if we have a button press and we have a specific instruction or set of instructions that need to run, that's going to be part of your interrupt service routine, then you will want to tie that interrupt service routine to that particular vector or button press and that will be one certain line in your vector table. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then the processor will, uh, uh, you'll set that address via some instructions. We'll look at that in a minute. So the interrupt vector table in our RX-63N is 256 interrupts long. So if it's an address, how many bytes is allocated to the interrupt vector table? I got kind of the answer up there, right? An address is how many bytes? Four bytes, right? So that means four times 256 is 1K. So 1K is allocated to our table. And all it is is a table. So I guess the best way to look at this, and I don't think I have a picture of this, so I'll just make a picture of this. So somewhere we have this table and we'll call it address n you know, n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, n plus 4, n plus 5. So these four bytes represent one interrupt, and this would be interrupt number 0. n plus 6, n plus 7, n plus 8. This is interrupt 1 all the way down to interrupt 255 where you will have n plus 1023, right? So just for grins, um, whenever we have an interrupt occur, the system will be able to identify which one. Oh, it is number one, for example. And so what the processor will do is uh, ID the interrupt. Then the, uh, of course, it's going to save off the program counter and the uh, flags. 
save to stack. But this the address at n plus 5, wherever our interrupt table is, is going to be put into the PC. So as we said, this, let's say, is uh, an address to ISR associated with interrupt 1. And then, as we said before, then when you return means uh, restore the uh, program counter and flags. Understandable? Yes, sir. This is done by hardware. And now, in the process of compiling, there's actually an instruction here that is not just a regular return, but it's a return from interrupt. So, you know, we actually, in advanced embedded, we'll look at what this means in assembly language. We'll look at what this means. Actually, we're going to go into this in great detail in assembly language, um, actually at the beginning of uh, the semester for um, uh, advanced embedded. And the neat thing is that you really don't have to worry about any of this because this is all done in hardware. The only thing you have to worry about is you have to create, so you create the ISR and declare it as an ISR. And we'll have instructions on how to do this in a few minutes. Or I may leave this for Sam, I'm not sure. Let's see how this goes. So there are different types of interrupts. Uh, there are interrupts from external pins. I've kind of alluded to button presses and such. There are interrupts from peripheral modules. So a good example would be ADC. ADC has done a conversion. It tells you it's done. Or serial communications. A byte has been received. Come get it. Or serial communications transmit. I have successfully, the hardware has successfully transmitted the byte that you gave it. It's time to give it a new one. These are all examples of interrupt service routines that can be called based on you setting up interrupts for that different types of uh, operations. There are also software interrupts, things like you could actually write a specific instruction that says call interrupt N. You could actually force that. Or there are non-maskable interrupts. I am not positive I need to see this, but I think, uh, but I think the reset button is, is a non-maskable interrupt. Or there are other types of things that go on that might be interrupts. Or a divide by zero um, is another option for an interrupt. There's also some associated with the floating point uh, device. So non-maskable are not or cannot be ignored by the processor. Uh, Non-recoverable errors, serious hardware errors. Uh, one example I seem to remember would be um, addressing or uh, referencing an address outside of the uh, correct address uh, range. That will, uh, uh, that will be an example. Oh yeah, there we go. A non-maskable interrupt is the reset pin, which basically says, in fact, the reset pin could mean different things to you depending on how you write the interrupt service routine. It could be wipe out all memory, wipe out everything inside the machine, uh, except for the code, of course, and start from scratch. Or it could be, let's see if we can gracefully recover from what our current setting is. So it all depends on what you uh, create in your interrupt service routine. 
Now, if you have an external interrupt, it could be associated when the, uh, uh, the level or when the interrupt is uh, detected. Well, let's see. Let's get... Okay, so there are ways to detect. And one is that the interrupt flag is given and you get a one when the interrupt is detected and is cleared by writing zero to that particular uh, uh, device once the request is accepted. And that's this level detected. Uh, the edge is when you actually start running the interrupt uh, then the uh, then the interrupt itself is is clear. But one reason you want to clear an interrupt is why. If you get an interrupt from the transmit uh, device, right? From the transmit RS232 or the transmit UART, you want it to actually respond to that transmit, meaning that you have successfully transmitted a character and either give me another character or say you don't want to do that. And so by actually writing another byte into the transmit um, transmit register, it would reset that interrupt because you don't want to actually address that interrupt again and again and again. And this just shows you the example of uh, what is going on. In this case, the interrupt signal will be, uh, will be given to you and then um, once the, uh, the signal goes down, then the, uh, the flag goes down or by accepting the interrupt and completing uh, some sort of activity, it, it will uh, lower that flag as well. In some cases, the interrupt signal is just simply a pulse and um, it's recorded and if you don't address that interrupt and a pulse comes again, you've just missed one of the interrupts. All right, now there's a whole bunch of uh, um, registers that you can uh, set and I'm actually going to leave this for Sam to cover on Thursday because I want to talk about uh, finite state machines. All right, so uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, interrupts on the RX-63 and picking up where Dr. Conrad introduced it uh, last class. So as many of you are already familiar, interrupts are a way that you can stop execution of the uh, code that's currently executing on the microcontroller to service some event that's happened. Uh, so this is a big advantage over polling where you're constantly checking a register for new data, uh, where it's possible to miss something that might happen briefly. And it also increases the performance of your code as you're not, uh, it's not something you have to keep checking. You just, it'll happen right then and there. And you can also assign priority as well. Um, some of you probably experienced this a little bit with the previous lab because uh, the way we set set the lab up, uh, the example code was uh, meant to be polling driven just because it's typically a little easier to implement. Uh, but if you weren't, if you had a delay and you were waiting and you didn't incorporate in your delay constantly checking the register for new data, it was easy to miss. And uh, I found that in some people's code that they were missing interrupts because that, of that delay. So interrupts nice, uh, makes the code more sensitive, and uh, it's a lot easier to handle, um, or easier to catch these changes. So here's an example of uh, how an interrupt works in outside of a microcontroller, I guess, in the real world. Uh, so it's a little dated now as uh, pretty much everybody has a Keurig, but this is for boiling water for your own uh, coffee maker. So if you're making breakfast, you put water in the kettle, turn on the burner, put ground coffee, filter and cone, put cone on cup, get milk out of fridge, get cereal from the cabinet, and then you hear the, the kettle boiling and whistling and you go and you get that off the burner and you 
pour the boiling water through the coffee filter and make your coffee, then you get, go back to preparing your cereal, getting your bowl from the cabinet, pour cereal in the bowl, get spoon, and put milk back in the fridge. So interrupts make your breakfast process way easier, so you're not constantly watching water boil. Uh, so th there's a relatable example for everybody, I'm sure. Uh, so how the CPU processes interrupts. So currently the, the CPU will finish up the, the uh, instruction that it's currently processing. So if it's in the middle of uh, like multi uh, cycle, uh, floating point operations, so it'll finish that up. Then it saves the program counter and any flags to the stack so it can restore those later. And then it will go handle the interrupt service routine, which is the function that's called whenever an interrupt occurs. Uh, so it pauses everything, saves the stack, goes to the section of memory that has the address for the interrupt service routine that you've specified, executes that. Then once that's wrapped up, it'll go back to the stack, grab the pointer counter or, or program counter, and all the other flags, restore those, and then go back to the main program. So, like I said, uh, the function that is used to service an interrupt is called the interrupt service routine. Uh, interrupt service routines are stored in a section of memory called the interrupt vector table. It's a section of memory uh, that is allocated specifically for addresses to uh, the functions that are uh, for the interrupt handlers. So whenever it's called, the processor goes to that location of memory associated with that particular interrupt and calls the function from there. So the RX63N has a good bit of interrupts available. Uh, according to this, we have 256. Each interrupt source occupies four bytes in the table. And that's because of the 32-bit uh, address size from the microcontroller architecture. And uh, when the CPU accepts an interrupt, it acquires the four-bit address, like I said, from the interrupt vector table and executes the code. So uh, types of interrupts, multiple types of interrupts. Most of your interrupts are coming from peripherals. And you've, uh, as you've seen from previous labs that we've done, those peripherals have different conditions, so you have timers that will trigger, you have timer comparisons, you have uh, analog digital uh, readings uh, upon completion interrupts, so all sorts of interrupts triggered from the peripherals. You also have a few external pins that can be set up as interrupts, uh, and on the, mic the uh, RX 63N you've got 15 or 16 available. And those can be configured in a few different ways. You also have software interrupts, so something in your code, if you want that to generate an interrupt, you can. And then you have non-maskable interrupts, which are interrupts that you cannot ignore. Uh, there we go. Uh, non-maskable interrupts are interrupts that cannot be ignored by the processor. Uh, usually for uh, error handling or resets, so you know, I so said the reset pin is an example of a non-maskable interrupt. I think often the watchdog timer is also considered to be non-maskable interrupts. Uh, there's not too many of them, but you got to handle them. So, uh, interrupt request detection methods. The external pins that we use for interrupt detection uh, can be configured in a few different ways. Uh, one is edge detection. So the interrupt flag is set uh, to 1 whenever an interrupt is detected and is cleared by writing a 0 to it once the request is accepted. So this means that once the interrupt has been triggered, the flag to handle that is set and it stays there until you handle the interrupt. Then you have level detection. So whenever the condition that's triggering the interrupt is uh, 1 or a high, uh, when the processor gets around to checking that interrupt, uh, it will service it if the signal is still high. But if it goes low again, then it's possible for the processor to miss that. Uh, and this is better illustrated with this diagram. So here you see the edge detection. So we have a line that has the interrupt signal. 
which is generating the trigger for the interrupt, and then you have the actual flag where the microcontroller will handle it whenever the uh, processor gets around to it. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing to say because the concept of interrupts is they're handled immediately, but when you have complex code and you've got multiple interrupts, you know, maybe one of these might not be as high of a priority. Or maybe you're still finishing a long execution like we were talking about, the uh, finishing up like a floating point operation, and maybe this signal is very brief. But yeah, so edge detection, the flag gets set and it only gets cleared once the interrupt has been handled. Level detection, as long as the signal, the interrupt signal is still high, the uh, the interrupt will be handled and the flag will be cleared afterwards. So this allows sort of two different types of functionality. Uh, the interrupt will be able to uh, just be kind of looped. If the signal stays high, it'll just keep looping in that interrupt because after it finishes up, the signal's still high and it'll be called again. Or if this is a lower priority thing, if the event's already come and gone by the time you can service it, that allows the microcontroller to just kind of forget about it. Like it's, it's gone. Unlike with the edge detection where the flag is still high and it'll have to service that. So here are the registers for the RX63N that you have to configure for your interrupts. Well, depending on which ones you, you're using, you don't have to configure all of them. So you have the interrupt request register, interrupt request enable register, the priority register, fast interrupt register, software interrupt, activation register, the inter interrupt request control register, and uh, some associated with the non-maskable interrupts. We'll start by taking a look at the interrupt request enable register. So this is a whole list of registers that have one pin associated with enabling each of those, uh, I think it's those 256 uh, interrupts available. So we have a bit for each one of those to enable them if we're going to use it. So once you write a one to that, you're, you're set to use, well, you've got that enabled. Then you have another register, the interrupt request register, that uh, you have a whole byte here for each interrupt. Uh, and you have a flag in that byte where it if it's a zero, then there's no interrupt, and at one, then it is an interrupt. So it just holds the flag for the interrupt's trigger. We also have a priority register. Um, and this is where we can organize our interrupts uh, by importance. So interrupts that have a higher priority uh, will be serviced before ones that have lower priority. Uh, simple concept, uh, but it's an important thing. Uh, and you usually get this kind of functionality in uh, more uh, complex architectures. Some simple 8-bit microcontrollers might not have a priority level, so if one's not listed, uh, generally if there's no priority listed for a microcontroller, uh, if you're already in an interrupt service routine, it'll just ignore any other interrupts that are happening. So I think like the MSP430 we used earlier this year, I don't believe that had priority levels for the interrupts. So keep that in mind whenever you're working on a smaller microcontroller that it's possible to miss interrupts if you don't have priorities uh, to assign them. The interrupt control request register. Uh, this is used to select the type of external interrupts with the edge or level detection that we just talked about a few slides ago. These settings should only be done when the interrupt is disabled and after the interrupt is set up. The interrupt request bit for a particular external interrupt should be cleared and the interrupt enable bit should be set to one. So don't reconfigure your interrupts while they're in an interrupt. Seems like uh, good logic there. Interrupt controller unit, part of the microcontroller that receives the interrupt from the peripherals called the interrupt control unit. So. The interrupt control unit is responsible for detecting the interrupts, uh, enabling disabling interrupts, determining the interrupt destination, and determining the priority. So for configuring an interrupt for your microcontroller, there are a few different steps you'll have to go through. 
the peripheral or port pin must be enabled and configured. So if you're going to set up an interrupt for your ADC, make sure you configure your ADC first. Uh, again, a reasonable thing to do. Uh, of course, if you have uh, uh, external interrupts coming from a GPIO, make sure you have that configured as uh, an input and with uh, data direction registers and have all that set up as you need. Uh, be sure to assign it a priority. Uh, if the value is zero, then it's disabled. So assign it, assign it something for the 63N. Then make sure you enable the interrupt in the uh, peripheral. So as you saw with the, uh, even though we were polling in the lab for the uh, UART, we still had to enable the interrupt there as well. And then you'll have to enable the interrupt in the interrupt control unit. So that's uh, associated with those registers we just looked at a few slides back. So before enabling registers, the ISR for interrupt needs to be defined. Uh, Renesas has provided a macro for defining the interrupt service routine. So we have here uh, pound pragma interrupt. You give it a service, uh, the subroutine name, and then you pass it a vector equal to the associated vector for the interrupt that you're using. So vector number, so each of those, uh, bless you, uh, each of those interrupts that we uh, looked at have a vector name associated with it, and that vector name relates to the location in the interrupt uh, vector table that has that where the address for this subroutine gets stored. Uh, and the pragma, okay, so the pragma uh, preprocessor command is a little different for each C compiler and varies a lot with uh, embedded compilers. So for this one, uh, the Renaissance compiler, we say pragma interrupt. What what happens here is that tells the compiler to assign the address of the subroutine that you're going to call for that interrupt in the memory location associated with the vector number right there. So you'll need to make sure you call that, then make your subroutine name. If you see, it's uh, we have void subroutine, subroutine name void. It's always going to look like that because you cannot pass variables to an interrupt and you cannot return variables from an interrupt. So if you need an interrupt to modify something uh, inside, it needs to be a global variable. So there you have the function prototype and there's a simple uh, example of the actual function. So to set the interrupt, uh, Renesas has included a few uh, handy uh, function names to uh, easily set these things. So you have uh, to clear the flag or just to access the flag in general, you have this IR function. So you have a uh, defined macro associated with each peripheral and then one associated with each interrupt so you can pass it those and then you can set the flag or you can view it uh, set, such as we have here with the if condition checking it for to see if the uh, flag has been set. Oh, also, uh, I'm going to roll back here for this pragma interrupt. So this is specific for the RX 63 in. Uh, other microcontrollers you run into, they might have different ways for accessing their interrupts. So uh, I know for the AVR microcontrollers, they do things, uh, the compiler is already aware of several names for their interrupt service routines. So depending on the architecture that you're using, you'll need to make sure you consult your compiler's uh, documentation to learn how to access those individual interrupts. So here we have an example code of setting a switch as an input using interrupts. So at the beginning, we've got an include file for a header. Uh, we define switch one as an interrupt with the pragma statement. So you can see here we have switch one int is going to be our function name, and that's going to be associated with the uh, interrupt request 
eight. So that's going to be the eighth interrupt available for the external pins. And we're going to say that's connected to one of the uh, switches on the board. And here we've got the function prototype for int. And we've got some more function prototypes down here. Not sure why there is a function prototype for main that is not needed for C. Uh, we have a function called LED rotate. And then we have a setup function for the interrupt. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen this now, but it's always good practice to make a uh, an enable or a setup function for peripherals that you're using, even interrupts, because your code will just look sloppy if you don't organize it into various subroutines. Uh, then we have defined a global variable for containing the switch press, kind of like the demo codes have. Uh, and define a variable for the current LED. Then main begins. Uh, Enable LEDs, then we call the setup function for our interrupt. And then we got a while that checks for our switch press. And if the switch is pressed, it looks like it switches LEDs and then clears the flag from the switch press. So here is the function that enables the interrupt. So we've got the enable for IRQ8. Um, we set the uh, uh, the GPIO up for uh, detecting uh, signal. Uh, so that's the ICR and I see you. Off the top of my head, I don't recognize what this syntax does explicitly, but you can look that up. Uh, enable the switches, and there, there you've got the interrupt priority register. And uh, Renesas has also provided a function that makes it easy to set up the priority for that. Uh, so you've got you clear the flag for the interrupt, and then you enable the interrupt. So yeah, so it looks like they clear it before they configure it. So or they disable the interrupt before they configure it. So that's. Uh, yeah, just the way they discussed it on the slides earlier. So not a whole lot to it for the uh, general purpose interrupts. Uh, so here we have a little more explanation for the code that I just kind of said. And there's uh, state machines, which I guess Dr. Conrad already talked about. So uh, I think that wraps it up for uh, interrupts on the RX-63. And uh, Does anybody have any questions? regarding any of this content. Okay, so Dr. Thorsett Hill never showed up, so we'll uh, move on to the quiz.